We're delving into the opportunity and risk-filled world of youth basketball. It's Tuesday, May 28th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. level, we can generally see what's going on in the basketball world. But in the U.S., the talent pipeline starts much earlier, and much of it is sourced from leagues owned by apparel companies. The incentives that all of this sets up pull the sport and its athletes in certain directions, and much of that happens out of the public eye. My next guest, Mike Nichol, spent years documenting what's broadly referred to as AAU basketball for a documentary called The Spoils. Quick point of clarification, one that I needed myself. There is a youth sports focused nonprofit called AAU, but when Mike uses that term, he's referring to a broader constellation of privately owned leagues and training academies. Station is coming up next. I'm joined now by filmmaker, Mike Nickel. Welcome, Mike. Happy to be here, Owen. Great to have you on. Uh, so you are, you've got a film coming out called The Spoils focused on AAU basketball. Uh, which stands for Amateur Athletic Union. It's this huge, sprawling nonprofit focused on youth sports, and it's a, a major factory machine of of youth basketball talent. Uh, why did you want to? Why, why was this worth a film in in your mind? You know, I think when it comes to like as a filmmaker, I'm uh, really interested in the way that systems operate, right? And having spent most of my life in one way or another traveling through the American basketball system. You know, the NBA is still one of the, the few things that sits at the center of whatever remains of like American monoculture, right? Like your grandmother probably knows who LeBron is, right? Your mom knows who Steph is, right? And so it's obviously this global entity, but in my personal experience, both as a storyteller, as a player, and just as a person who loves the game, uh, people like to think about the NBA, college, and AAU as these separate entities, Right. They kind of are that are all siloed. But the reality is, from a interconnectivity standpoint, they're all interconnected pieces like Lego pieces of the same broader system. And so a deeper understanding of the way that the NBA actually operates requires that layered connection, because I always like to describe AAU as like the escalator to the NBA. And I, th I, th I think especially today, almost everything you see about the way the NBA operates is informed by the incentives that are established on the grassroots level. And so for me, what I really wanted to do with this film was create this kaleidoscopic system portrait um, that really, I think, functions as kind of like an origin story for modern day NBA culture. So um, we kind of really unravel the ground level because it has so many ripple effects going up. Yeah, and and let's get into that. So yeah, I'm curious about like how AAU operates as an escalator to the NBA. Is it an effective escalator? Uh, I mean, clearly it's it's doing it's having some some effects. It's getting a lot of players into the NBA. Uh, but yeah, what are what are the incentives and what kind of effects do they have? You know, throughout the system, you you have to kind of come at it from a sense of understanding what it's optimized for, right? And who's designing it. Um, and the reality is like, again, if you permit me a little bit of more like broader thematic observation, the reason I've always been drawn to this material is because it is really like, in my eyes, this quintessentially American space. And what I mean by that is like all the things that make America, America are on like full display here, right? So you're talking about really bottomless capitalism, raw ambition, almost no regulation, um, you know, certainly some like racial th themes, you know, that are there subtextually. Um, and so like, it is this really rich storytelling ground. And so when you're, and you know, the sort of commercialized corporate influence of this system that we've designed, and it's like, well, who's designed it? And the reality is the shoe companies are the ones that bankroll this system. So when we're talking about what it's designed to produce, it's designed to identify, anoint, and ultimately monetize the next LeBron, the next superstar. 
And if, again, if you're coming at it from that like system operation standpoint, that's very different than optimizing for player development. What's, what's best for these families and their, these players. Um, you know, this might seem like a old fashioned notion, but like what's best for the spirit or soul of the game. Right. But like the reality is when you have these corporations with their commercial interests, you know, the product that gets spat out on the other side is, you know, very informed by like why it exists in the first place. Yeah. Well, what I'm curious there is where we see that split between, you know, the incentives of the AAU system and, you know, maybe what's best for the player, the game, because so many of these players, most of them, all of them, they want to be in the NBA. They want to make a ton of money. They're, I'm sure their families want them that for them too. So, and which is not to say like, what are you talking about? But, um, but yeah, I'm curious where, you know, in the, and AAU is vast, we should say, you know, it's so many more players in the NBA, obviously. So most of these kids aren't getting anywhere close, but um, where are we seeing those splits of what AAU wants and maybe what's good for the player and the family? There's just a, like, what I always talk about in terms of, like, when you're entering the system, right? And I, I think we've really designed this movie to be kind of a blueprint for how to navigate the space. And I always like to say, like, you better be clear about what your priorities are. Because there's a difference between prioritizing for exposure or prioritizing for recruiting versus prioritizing development. Whether that be skill development, whether that be, like, team dynamic development, you know, personal development. But, you know, the reality is if you want to be recruited and you want to get seen, this is like a mandatory space to be in. And so I, what I know to be true is like one of, one of our core theses is that like a, the AAU culture philosophy ethos trickles up, right? It's not, it's not a trickle down, it's a trickle up because when it is this mandatory space, think about it, the players that are ultimately arriving in the NBA are filtered out through this system. And the way that they approach the game is dictated by what they've spent the most time doing. So if you've got an 18 or 19 year old arriving in the NBA, you know, one and done, et cetera, and we can talk about the rules that are sort of interconnected, they carry with them what they've done the most. So if they've spent seven or eight years inside of this system and then do like a, a one year sort of like apprenticeship and as it wanted done, they're arriving with this sort of baked in philosophy about the way the game should be played, what they're in it for. And that, that these, I don't have value judgments against these things, but like, there's sort of just like this inevitability that we have around like, oh, well, this is the way the system is. So that's the way it's supposed to be. But I think there's a really, you know, it's not even clear to me necessarily that like the system produces the best players. Right. If you look at the best players in the NBA right now, I, I think there's a strong argument to be made. Maybe Ant is a new entry into that top five, but they're almost all all foreign players. Right. The la the most recent MVPs, Giannis, Jokic, Embiid, Luca, Shea is Canadian. Like, you know, we got Ant and Tatum kind of poking job, poking around that top five. But like whether or not the sort of like uh, developmental system that we've cultivated actually yields the best players, I think is an open question. Yeah. And I've certainly heard people make the point that, you know, the, the development leagues in Serbia and Croatia, they're producing players like Jokic, who, you know, he's, he's huge, but also he can basically be a point guard and he can play any position, um, you know, Luca too. And, um, so how does the NCAA factor into all this because i mean you <laughs> referenced you know college basketball is basically uh you know one-year apprenticeship for some of these guys um but yeah are, is this is the ncaa just as hooked into this system and profiting from it or is it is it just kind of the the stop along the way to the nba if if you're that good the landscape has changed a lot over the last 11 years and you know we shot this film over an 11 year period of time which is part of what i think makes it so special and I would say that's probably the most transformational period of time in the history of this space. So what the NCAA, the, the space that the NCAA used to occupy versus what they occupy now is obviously very different. I think they have some important identity questions to figure out, which is probably its own film and its own pod. Um, but I think the, the bottom line is 
we're and and one of the agents in our film talks about this. Uh, we're in the age of options. Players and families want the most options possible. And, you know, whether it's overtime, elite, whether it's going to the Australia Stars program, G League, Ignite, what, you know, like we're seeing all these other options pop up. And I think kind of going back to the sort of incentives, I, I and again, this is more observational than anything else, but what I think the AAU system does, and, you know, it's I, I kind of leave it to our viewers to decide whether this is good or bad, but I think it's really individualized what is a team game, right? So whether you're talking about hopping from team to team to, you know, to kind of like leverage more exposure or more, you know, play on this circuit or play on that, you know, it's, we've really com commodified, commercialized and individualized this team sport. And so where and how the NCAA scrambles to fit back into this, um, you know, remains to be seen, but they still are cashing those March Madness TV checks. And, you know, I, I personally think that like, you know, NIL is its own, is its own thing, but um, it's all still very much evolving. I guess I'm still finding myself wondering, um, you know, to what degree AAU is creating the system and is big enough that it's, you know, big enough to create its own weather, but also it's also a, a product of a system where, kids want to get paid earlier. They know that they can get paid earlier. Um, they know if they're, you know, not just like an 18 year old in, I guess you can't be 18. If you're a 20 year old in the NBA, um, uh, you can, you, you could be on your rookie contract, but if you've got a shoe deal or something like you're set for life, um, in a way you might not be if, you know, you're out of the league in a couple of years. Um, so yeah, I'm just wondering like to what degree AAU is just responding to the desires of the players who see this huge opportunity and, and want to cash in when they can. What you, what I think is important to understand is, so going back to something I was talking about earlier in terms of the interconnectivity, these, these levels are inexplicably, inextricably linked, but, and they have these mismatched set of rule priorities, but from a broad standpoint, it is completely um, ungoverned, right? So the NBA sets the age limit at, you know, you've got to be a year removed from college to be eligible to come in. That obviously has downward effects. But the reality is like, there is no central governing body that is sort of like supervising the fluidity of the system. So ultimately AAU is able to sort of fill a void or fill this sort of like, you hear the term wild, wild west being thrown around a lot for decades. But the reality is there's, it's unregulated, it, it is completely unregulated. Like it's this unregulated space. And so it creates this opportunity for these, you know, if we're talking about the player empowerment era, the value, the, the reality is that like the value that underpins this entire system has always lived inside the players. And the system that grows up around it is essentially a collection of corporations and adults that for one reason or another are trying to attach themselves to this talent. The reason it gets a little sticky is because it's an inescapable fact that the talent can be a 12, 13, 14, 15 year old kid. And that's why the space itself has been so sort of like, shadowy is a word I like to, to use, but you know, it's like when you have these big Fortune 500 companies that want to attach themselves to these young human beings that they essentially see as lottery tickets, whether it's the people immediately around them or the larger entities that want their, want to be attached. You know, we talk about it in the movie a lot. These, these companies and these people want to reach these kids. They want to be involved. And if you can't control what these companies are doing, it's going to be really hard to put any boundaries around AAU. And that's kind of where we are right now. There are no boundaries of any sort. Yeah, and like how young are, are like companies like sneaker companies or whoever else, uh, how young are the kids that they are, you know, interacting with on some level? I mean, it's all relationships, right? So as one of the, you know, we talked to some collective, uh, some collectives in the film and they make the point that, look, a kid or a teenager can be understood to be a professional the moment that they begin presenting value to a brand or a company. And I think people are kidding themselves 
if they think that it doesn't matter to these shoe companies or to these broadcast partners, or like, you know, to, to these brands that want to get attached, if they think that it doesn't matter that they're wearing a certain brand of sneaker when, you know, a, a clip goes viral, like you're kidding yourself. And what I think the shoe companies have always been really savvy about understanding is that like, it's one thing for kids to watch TV and be like, I want to be like Kobe. I want to be like LeBron. But the reality is when they go to school with kid, you know, the kids they go to school with, the kids that are their peers, right? Like they want to be like that kid just as much. And so whether it's shoe companies that want to have a relationship with a kid when he does turn pro and sign, sign him to a, you know, uh, sponsorship deal, whatever, whatever. It's like anything agents, shoe companies, like they, you got to start building that relationship early because when the kid is ready to, you know, becomes an adult and is now making like multi-million dollar decisions, they're going to, you know, relationships matter. So like that is in many ways, what AAU is, is this relationship building space. And that's again, what makes it such an, a uh, sort of like capitalistic American thing. And, and and this is sort of like a, we're we're getting close to the end. This is sort of a weird one to end on. But I've been referring to AAU as just like this enormous thing. But could you like give us a sense of just like how how big this is? Like if I just like is it in like every major city? Like how 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 much of the map are we covering here when it comes to youth basketball in America? Oh, it's nationwide. the 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 funny part is it's it's sort of become known as AAU basketball. But it actually has no affiliation with the AAU. So the AAU is a national organization called the Amateur Athletic Union. But when people talk about AAU basketball, what they're referring to are these private leagues funded by the shoe companies that are very exclusive, very invite only. Um, and like what they've been smart about doing is consolidating all the talent into one place. I think at first, at least to make it easier for the college coaches to gather together and see them all in one place which again is another example of something that's getting optimized for that is conscious or subconscious. But um, so how big it is, you know, Nike has the EYBL, Adidas has their circuit, Under Armour has their circuit. Uh, you know, Puma has been making a big push into the basketball world. So like when you're talking about AAU basketball, you're talking about this like movable feast of private events that is all competing for the talent to come play in their event. And so there is no overarching umbrella organization other than like Nike, Adidas, Reebok, like that, like those are like literally who is funding and running these leagues, like with no intermediary. Yeah, exactly. So, so AAU is, is, is just like its own nonprofit that is, that's just kind of doing its own thing that is outside of what we're talking about here. It's completely unrelated to the world that people think think of when the term AAU basketball is brought up. I see. Wow. Um, and, huh. And, and so, so the, like the training process for, you know, most is, is the most like serious, you know, teenagers who want to, you know, get into, to, you know, a, a maybe a D one school or just like the quickest path to the NBA that's all being funded by the shoe companies. Correct. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, I and mean, it's a fascinating, yeah, shadowy world is, is, is definitely a, a way to put it. I mean, it's, um, uh, because so many people like come become aware of a basketball player, like, you know, when they're a, a top college player. Or... Well, and then the other thing too, is that, you know, there's this media apparatus that has grown up around it. Right. So when you're talking about like the mixtape culture and the, like the ball is lifeification of this stuff, you know, the sort of public profile of a lot of these kids starts getting really blown up much earlier. And so when, you know, our film and the, the sort of thesis is talking about like the way that the entire system has been professionalized. Now there really is no bottom, right? Because if it's not a, if it's, if it's totally kosher for players to sh get paid in college, then it's not disqualifying for them to get to be paid in whatever form or fashion for that. And so, you know, it's just a brand new world. And, um, you know, I think for so long, the question was whether or not college athletes could get paid. And when we started making that movie, that was illegal. But I always laughed because anybody that's on the inside of this world knows that that party is over long before these, these guys arrive on a college campus. 
right? Um, so now the things that used to happen sort of in secret are just happening in broad daylight. Um, and you know, it's uh, still evolving. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Mike Nickel, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, make sure you are subscribed and drop us a rating or review wherever you're listening. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.